Man, come on. Somebody get excited. I think we can just move to the blessing prayer. Wyatt just preached the gospel. That's about as clear as you can say it. So good. Listen, if the Lord puts that in your heart to minister and be part of what he's doing in our children's ministry or our youth ministry, I want you to, to see Chantel. Chantel Gonzalez oversees Ocean Kids. And, um, and let me say this clearly. If you, if you don't like being around kids, please do not sign up to serve. <laughs> we, we, we don't want you serving there. <laughs> we don't want you to serve out of obligation. We want you to serve out of obedience and what God's putting in your heart. But please uh, step into that. Be a part of what God's doing in Ocean Kids. Would you stand with me? Last week we began this series, There Is More. And I love the word that Pastor Phil had for us, just of a step of faith. And God's going to stir. He's going to speak to you today about what steps need to be, that, that need to be taken from our lives and what, what is in front of you and what is front of, in front of us as a, as a body. Our, our keynote verse is found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots go down into him and your lives, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we say thank you. Thank you that today you invite us to more, and we respond to you. Lord, would you meet every heart as only you can, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So we, we started last week, and we talked about that this series is going to parallel what we see in the book of Malachi. Malachi is a name that just simply means my messenger, and there's this prophetic message that God gives his people, and he meets them at this place where they had drifted so far from the values and the standard of worship that he had, had taught and, and had instilled in the people of Israel. And so God is meeting them in the book of Malachi, and I love how he starts. And, it, and it, this is the same truth that we see in Colossians 2, 6, that as you have received Christ Jesus, you know, there's not a person that walks with God that has received Christ Jesus that did so because of how they worked their way to be pleasing with God. As you have received Christ Jesus means that every single one of us in a realization of the place of need, that this is impossible for me, but yet by the sacrifice of Jesus, belief in him, God has made a way for that divide to be ended. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. Malachi does not start, and Malachi can be looked at as a heavy uh, book of the Bible, like, man, God is dealing with his people. But listen to how Malachi starts. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 says this, I have always loved you, says the Lord. This is how God invites us to more. He doesn't invite us to more by saying, listen, you are terrible. <laughs> Get it together. What's your problem? He, he, he doesn't speak with condemnation. He doesn't use shame to draw us and to call us to more. He starts at this same place that Colossians 2 says, I have always loved you. And Malachi is this back and forth where the people defiantly say, what's the matter? Aren't we doing things right? And God begins and he says, listen, no, the offerings that you're bringing me, they reveal you've lost the principle of first. I have now slid to a place of being part of your life, not the source of your life. I have left the place of being first in your life. And in, in, in this place of worship, your worship is going to other things. Your first is going to other things. So return to me. And he says to his people, when I'm not first, your faith is going to suffer. Your confidence in life is going to suffer. And then he goes from faith and he says, listen, your family is going to suffer 
when I'm not first. And then chapter 3, he, he says, your finances are going to suffer and are suffering because I've left the place of being first. Malachi is a book of the Bible that calls God's people to return to God and place him as first in their lives. This was seen in the family. The family unit had broke down to a place that divorce was rampant. It, it was something beyond even what we see today. It was at a place where God's people were now subject and slaves to their desires. Where the covenant of marriage and what God was saying to his people, and this is where we get in chapter 2, God says these words, I hate divorce. Now, I know that, that statistics tell us that, that over 50% of that, that are at the sound of my voice have experienced and walk through a divorce. And I want you to hear very clearly, at no place does God say, I hate those that have been divorced. What, what he is saying is, this is the opposite of my commitment to you. My love for you is steadfast. My love for you is unwavering. And it is from that place that you are to love each other. It is this understanding of covenant and so his heart is broken as he's talking to his people and they're saying, what are we doing wrong? And he says, husbands, you're leaving your families based on your desires. Adultery rampant because they were slaves to their desires. And ultimately what, what God's heart was saying and what he's saying to us today is it's time for us to be, come back to the place of understanding what it is to be a child of God what it is to treat ourselves as a child of God. I think if, there, if, if I could write my job description, uh, it would be this, that, that my job description is to make sure you know what it is to be a child of God and to hold you accountable to treat yourself as a child of God. This is the place that God had led his people. You know, the, the kids that were raised... As an Israelite, they were raised not just in a place of like belonging to the family that they were born into. They, they were raised in this knowing that I have been birthed into God's family. Listen to these instructions. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. These are the, the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. Now, this fear is not afraid of God. This fear is a reverential awe, a worshiping fear, the greatness of God, the majesty of God seen and recognized. If you obey his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you. And you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. The God of your ancestors. Think, see this picture of family. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to the commands I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. You see, the, these commands reveal and they show that God's people were, were taught with this understanding. You belong to something even bigger than your family. Not only were you born knowing I belong to a family, I wasn't just born. None of us have ever had the experience of being hatched in an egg out in a field. We were born with an immediate connection. And as bad as that connection may have been, there is a father that wants you to know I want to restore you and my connection with you is enough. We're born knowing that we are to belong. You know, we, we, we know this. We have a desire to belong. We have this desire to, to find our people, to know the, this place of similar interest. Um, 
I, I took a little bit of time this last week and just kind of did a little research on, on what are some odd groups and associations that gather. Listen to this. Do you know that there's an official association for pet obesity prevention? If this is a burden for you, I want you to know there's some, there's some people that share your burden. There is a club that is the four C's, the CCCC club. This is the Cookie Cutter Collectors Club. They're not just about cookies. They're not just about cookie cutters. They are collecting cookie cutters. It's amazing. Uh, this one just made me shake my head. There's an association of gravestone studies. <laughs> it just got dark. <laughs> some dark. Some dark humor for us today. We have this desire to belong. I, I was raised in the 80s in Oklahoma, and that was some glory days of Oklahoma football. Barry Switzer was the coach. I have really fond memories of laying in our living room next to the speaker listening to football games with my dad. And I would lay in the living room, and this is before like everything was on TV. And so you listen to games on the radio, and I would listen with my dad, and, and, and it was this bonding moment. And, it, and it's just this, this place that, that dad and I know each other. And listen, I was telling this story in the service before, and in the lobby, a guy came up to me, and he was like, Man, you're from Oklahoma? I'm from Oklahoma too. And he was like, Boomer Sooner. This is the first time we've met, and we're saying weird things to us like Boomer each other, like Boomer Sooner. And you have this connection of, of our people. I took my dad, it was, a, it was a highlight a few years ago, I took my dad to the OU Texas game. That's the biggest game on the, the OU schedule is, is when Oklahoma University plays Texas, they play in Dallas. It's halfway between Austin, the Texas campus, and Norman, the Oklahoma campus. And they split the stadium at the 50-yard line. This side is the colors of God in crimson and cream. <laughs> this side is the rejected colors of burnt orange. And, and it was awesome. And dad and I are surrounded with OU fans. And it's like, we're yelling and we're screaming. And then, and then OU fans, my people started screaming things that I was like, yeah, wait, I can't scream that. <laughs> we, we know that we're created to belong. And I want you to write that down. I want you to, to remember that, that you were born to belong in family. You're born to belong in family. There's a desire that fills each one of our hearts and knowing that at a level that is unshakable, I'm supposed to belong to something. Adam and Eve is the example of what it felt like when that desire first hit that I, that I no longer belong. I, I have a desire to get back to what it was and what it is supposed to be. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. If you're from Oklahoma, you say naked. I was naked. What, what, what is Adam articulating? He is saying, something has changed. I, I, I no longer belonged as I once did. This environment feels different. It's no longer the home and the safe place that, that it once was. How do I get it back to that place? How do I meet that divide? What, what do I do because I don't belong as I once did? It's a reality that all, all of us know. We, we know that there is this gap that, that we want to bridge to be home. You know, one of the things that we love to say when we have guests is we want to say, welcome home. 
And we're not saying that because we, we hold Ocean Church as the ultimate authority of a welcoming place and a family atmosphere. We're saying that because there is no home like the home that God has prepared and filled as his church and his family in this earth. Over two billion gather and know themselves as the family of God. It's the greatest force on this planet. It's the, the, the only place that, that true change can happen. It, you know, if this crisis that we see in this war that's happening in Ukraine reveals anything, it is that the governments of this world are not the answer. The church of Jesus Christ is the answer. You know that in America alone, there, there are 120 that, that million that gather on the weekends, that step out and gather. That's more than any sporting event, any, any NFL deal. There are 120 that get out and say, Jesus, you're going to be first in my life. My life will be set by what you say. That is the family of God. That's what we're invited into David described it this way, the heart of God in Psalm 68. He said, he's the father to the fatherless, defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy, but he makes the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. If we're born knowing that we are to belong then the reality is because of sin, each one of us have been born knowing we are rejected from family. We know, our hearts know that there is a divide from the holiness of God and the nature of my heart. This is a knowing that each one of us has. It's not a good feeling. You know, many of you, you, you know what it is to be rejected at a deep level. Many of you have walked through heartbreak and divorce and, and division in family, and you know the pain of rejection in relationships. We know this. Life throws these things at us. Many of us know what it is to be in a job and, and, and think things are good, and then all of a sudden that job ends and we're rejected from the place that we're supposed to work and provide. We, we know these places. We know what it is to be rejected. You know, it's interesting. When I was in, in ninth grade, uh, there was a, the basketball season ended, and then there was this uh, traveling team that you had to be invited to be a part of. And, and I got together with, with my friends, and I remember how awkward it felt because they were all talking about that they had got the phone call. This is before email. So they had all got the phone call that they were part of the traveling team. And I was the only one there that did not get the phone call. And I remember just being like, I, I just want to be anywhere but here. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I just want to go hide because I don't belong where I thought I belonged. And the... The, it had been a misunderstanding, and so, but it was, it, so the coach had called, and either the line was busy or something, but I had missed the call, and I, I'll never forget being there and being in this place where I thought I belonged, I thought everything was good, and then that awkward place of, I don't fit with this group anymore, and we know these places. <laughs> This last week, I, I, I just share these things with you because I don't know what to do with the questions that my kids ask me. <laughs> we were in the car the other night, and, and I don't remember which one of them it was, but somebody asked, like, hey, Mom, did you have boyfriends before Dad? <laughs> and then asked me the same question. You know what you do, what a holy parent does? You put worship music on and you turn it all the way up. <laughs> but it, it's, it's so funny. So Anna and I, you know, as we're talking with the kids about, you know, these things, you, you go back 
And I remember being brokenhearted in relationships, not being able to see what was ahead and what the Lord had for me, just knowing the pain. The voice of rejection is so strong. It's so loud. We all know it. But listen, what I want you to hear today, there is not a rejection that you can experience, a depth of pain that you can feel that is equal to the depth and rejection that Jesus stepped in for you. And because of that, our rejection has a place for healing. Our pain has a place of restoration. Isaiah 59, 2 says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Have sinned, past tense. We can look back and say, yeah, it's because of Adam, but I'm doing pretty good right now. And Romans says, no, and fall short. That's present tense. That's today. Paul paints this picture of a bullseye and, and says the holiness of God is the bullseye. And it doesn't matter if you're a millimeter outside, you cannot hit the holiness of God at your best. All have sinned and fall short. And it's this realization. Jesus told his disciples and those listening in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you are to be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And later he's in a discussion where a rich man comes and wants to follow him. And Jesus says, wonderful, sell all your belongings and come follow me. And he couldn't do it. He, he looked and said, I, I have this. And whatever that represented to him, whether it was identity, whether it was provision, whether it was protection, whether it was status, he could not let go of that and allow Jesus to be his identity moving forward. Allow himself to be found in Christ moving forward. And he went away. The Bible says he went away because he had many possessions. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And his disciples looked at that and they said, who can be saved then? The picture you just painted is, is impossible. And that's the message that he wanted them to hear, that yes, it's impossible. Jesus said this. He said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. What was he pointing to? He was pointing to what he knew. Ephesians says he knew this before the foundation of the world. You know, I remember one time, I think about the dread of, of getting in trouble. I remember um, I, I felt like I was so behind in watching movies. My parents had a certain uh, standard for, for watching movies in our home. And so like I'd be with friends at school and they would talk about these movies. And I'm like, man, I don't know anything about those movies. And I went to a friend's house and he had a lot of those movies. And so I was like, hey, let me borrow some of those movies. And so I would wait until everybody went to bed and then I would get up and watch those movies. And, and then I would hide them in my room. And, uh, and so one day I came home and all the, the things, all the movies that I had hidden were just laid across the bed. <laughs> and you know what my dad did? He just let me wait. <laughs> like I, I knew it was about to, to go down and he just let me wait. So he had found them, he laid them out, and then he waited till later that night. And so the dread <laughs> that filled my heart, like that was worse than the punishment, it was just the waiting and going like, oh man, this is gonna be so bad. I messed up. Ephesians tells us that before the foundation of the world, God looked at you and I and said, I love you and I'm dying for you. He, he, he held that in his heart, looking forward. And so this truth that, that we were born rejected from family wouldn't fall on you and I to make the difference. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For, 
For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. What a statement that, that Jesus would step into a place of rejection for you and I so that we would be in this place where God would see us as perfect. Like, let, let your heart just take that in a little bit, that, that God would allow you and I in our brokenness and on the process of our lives, we know our hearts, we know what goes on in that place. And yet he sees it all and he knows it all. And he says, by the sacrifice of my son, you are perfect before me. Positionally, you are perfect before me. And we, we go, Lord, but I'm in a process. And you know what we do? We see it this way. Like, you know, the, the, the arm of the Statue of Liberty that has the, it has a spiral staircase that you go up. And we see it like this, like, I'm doing better. I'm doing good. I'm reading my Bible every day. I'm doing so good. Oh, I sinned and I fell. And it's back to square one. But because of Jesus, we, we don't serve God to please God. From being pleasing to God, we serve God. Isaiah 53 is the clearest picture. It's even a clearer picture than, than those that were eyewitnesses of the cross. Isaiah points ahead and, and he, he, he points to Jesus and he says, he was despised and rejected a man of sorrows. Isaiah sees Jesus at the cross and he sees this moment where Jesus quotes Psalm 22 and he, he, he exclaims and there's this cry that comes out of him as the separation between his father that you and I are born into the rejection from the family of God somehow and it, it it's so hard to make sense of this theologically that a hundred percent God a hundred percent man could step and place himself outside of the family of God in a place of rejection place of sin that you and I should own and yet he did that and this cry comes out of him and Mark 15 records Jesus saying my God my God why have thou forsaken me and, and he stepped into that and this is what I want our hearts to know and to come back to today is I want you to be able to take the places of rejection the places that, that you feel that you don't belong, the places that are pain, the places that, that we know, like, I, I, I don't know how to reconcile this. And I want you to see and know that Jesus stepped into a deeper pain. He stepped into a deeper place of rejection so that you and I, we could bring our pain and our rejection to him. And he would say, yeah, I see the brokenness of your life. I see the mess and I'm inviting you. You're part of my family. I want you to be brought in. You see, we're born rejected, but then we're born again, accepted into family. John chapter three, Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus and he, he tries to explain this to him. And he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And it was hard for Nicodemus. He, he, he couldn't understand it. And this is where this, this terminology comes from. What does it mean to be born again? We've all been born in a natural birth. There is a spiritual birth that is needed for every person on this planet to see and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when we do that and we see that and we believe, Romans says, we confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart that Jesus is God's son and God raised him from the dead. It says these words, you shall be saved. You're born again into family. You're brought into a belonging that is an unshakable belonging. It's a belonging that's not based on your commitment, it's based on His commitment. It's not based on how hard you work, 
It's based on what He has done and His power filling you. Can we bring our hearts to the Lord and say, God, I'm going to lay down my striving. I'm going to treat myself like a child of God. I'm going to receive the gift that Jesus paid for me. Would you bow your heads with me? I want you to listen to these words. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears our witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing today. He he is speaking to hearts today, and He is reminding you. Some of you, you, you've walked with God, and yet you found yourself in a place of striving, trying to work your way to be pleasing with God, and He is coming to you saying, no, you are pleasing to me. You don't work your way to that place. You receive it. It's the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit, that God says, I have chosen you. You didn't work your way as an orphan to to look right so I would choose you. You didn't work hard and and, and put your best foot forward so I saw you and then I chose you. No, in in the depth of your brokenness and your pain, I saw you, I knew it all, and I chose you. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. I want to ask you today, if the Lord's dealing with you and you felt far from God, you felt distant from Him, and you know the Holy Spirit is drawing you, and He's inviting you to walk with Him from this place, not working to to show yourself as pleasing, but receiving what it is to be chosen as a child of God, would you simply raise your hand? I want to pray over you today. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord's going to remove the burdens of works righteousness. Thank you. As soon as you put it up, you can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, this is the belonging that's different. You can continue to put your hands up. If the Lord's dealing with you, let Him speak to your heart. God, thank you for drawing us the way that you do. Thank you. just give just a few more moments thank you thank you Lord thank you Jesus right, would you look up at me and go ahead why don't you just go ahead and stand to your feet we're going to pray together Every single one of you that raised your hand, I want you to know unmistakably, it's the Holy Spirit that's speaking to your heart. God is saying, I've always loved you. I want you to walk in a relationship with me that's not based on you, but it's based on me. Colossians 2 says, your roots are to go down into Him. Not you. Ephesians 1, 4 says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. You know, God doesn't have buyer's remorse with us. You know, Anna and I have these fun conversations. Anna, Anna loves to like, we'll buy something and even if we got it on sale, like we'll go home and she'll go research to make sure that we got a good price. And if she finds it for a better price, like it messes her up. I'm like, baby, what are you doing? Like, I, I have no buyer's remorse. 
I'm like, treat yourself 2022 all the time. I want you to know that there's not a moment in the heart of God that he regrets and has buyer's remorse for stepping into the place of rejection for you and I. It gives him great pleasure. What are his eyes filled with today when he looks at you? His eyes are filled with joy. Will you allow your heart to believe it? Will you allow your heart to see his eyes looking at you that way? I want you to pray with me. Every single one, pray with me. Say, Jesus, thank you that you stepped into rejection so I could be accepted. I could be brought in to the family of God. Thank you, Jesus. I believe in you as God's son that died for my sins and raised from the dead to meet me today, to be the source of life for my pain, my rejection, that I would know your love in Jesus' name. Amen.